a television debut now on BBC Two for the popular BBC Radio 4 series of fierce topical debate and discussion. The Moral Maze, chaired by Michael Burke. Good evening. Now that the possibility of nuclear war has receded, the greatest threat to mankind seems to be sex. All this week, a huge United Nations conference has been going on in Cairo. It's seen that the world's human population is out of control, that within 50 years we face a Malthusian disaster of drought, famine and war, that something has to be done. The facts are that it took 12,000 generations to build the world's population to one billion. It's taken four more generations to reach the present level of more than five billion. The scientists say that figure could double in the next 50 years. There's not enough food, water, natural resources to cope. Though not everybody agrees, and there's certainly no agreement on what to do to stop the population explosion. The Pope, in unlikely alliance with fundamentalist Muslims, sees an immoral agenda, liberalizing individual sexuality at the expense of the family willed by God. So is this issue so grave, so pressing, that steps have to be taken to restrict people's reproduction? More simply, what do we do about the people problem? The panel, Janet Daly of The Times, Edward Pierce of The Guardian, David Cook of Green College, Oxford, and Dr David Starkey of the London School of Economics. Janet. I find the idea of global social engineering pretty sinister, especially when it involves interfering in the most personal aspect of people's lives. But I think there are also far too many ideological vested interests weighing in here into a discussion in what was really about the conflict between individual freedom and mass suffering. Edward? In the absence of population restraint, a multitude of people will lead lives not worth living. And lives not worth living are better not lived. David? We live in a world where there's a clash of values. And on the one side, we've got the Western imperialism forcing the two-thirds world to behave in one way. And on the other side, we've got a Catholic and Muslim alliance trying to push its particular perspective on people. David Starkey. Michael, have you ever noticed that when people say, I'm going to do this on principle, it's always when they haven't got a sensible reason? And it seems to me that papal objections to birth control and abortion fall exactly into this category. They are unreasonable. I would even say that the Pope's role, or that of his representatives at Cairo, is not only unreasonable, it is actually immoral. David, thanks very much indeed. Our first witness is Dr William Oddy, a former priest, a commentator on social and religious affairs, who's somewhat cornered the market on the argument that there is no crisis, no crisis at all. How so? Well, it seems to me that the population explosion doomsday scenario uh, rests basically on three arguments, for all of which there's no evidence and against some of which there's considerable evidence. The first um, uh, argument is that the world will not be able to support, uh, so far as food is concerned, will not be able to feed the population that uh, we're likely to have in, say, 50 or 100 years' time. The second one is that even if we do feed them, we're going to run out of raw materials, uh, basic things like copper, um, iron, petroleum and so on. Uh, the third argument, and this, is, this has become an increasingly strong one with the ecological movement we've, we've seen coming up with the environmental movement that we've got much stronger over the last four or five years, that population growth causes uh, environmental degradation and that unless we're actually going to, uh, unless we're actually going to um, uh, have, if we want to avoid um, a total environmental catastrophe, we've got to cut the population back. And all of these three, three things you say are wrong? Yes, I think, right, I think they are. Edward Pierce, your witness. Why do you say they're wrong? Well, let's take the, the, the question about population. Mm. You believe that, uh, and food, you reckon that population can grow more or less exponentially and can be coped with by Well, it's not growing food. exponentially. That's the Malthusian right. idea, but it doesn't grow. It grows arithmetically. Uh, we've already heard the idea there's going to be a Malthusian... It can grow good and fast, and it hasn't been doing too badly since 1800. Sure, it, but it's not been growing exponentially as much well, as it would. Well, how many billion have we got today, Mr. Adi? 
Sorry? How many billion have we got today? Well, um, it's sort of, it'll be up to about five or six billion by now. It's 5.7. It's, 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 it's right. 5.7 billion. So exponential well, or not, there's a lot of it. it there's a lot of it. The, the point is that all reasonable ex uh, um, uh, estimates have, have, have said over the last 20 or 30 years that in probably we can almost certainly feed the yes. people who come. You, you're the food can grow. Uh, let me just sure, I mean, course, answer the question. Of course. I mean, the food, uh, the food supplies over the last 40 years, since the 50s, um, have risen per capita by 130 percent during a period in which the world's population has already doubled. But the population the people of the West world Africa, Bank, just to interrupt one second, the population of West Africa is scheduled, according to figures I was looking at only this morning, to rise by 148 percent in a very short period. Well, I think we have to look at Africa as a quite special case in many ways. Um, firstly, um, most of the uh, famines that have taken place in Africa have taken place because of, for political reasons, not because of uh, population growth. Um, warfare, uh, government incompetence and so on. There's been uh, almost no famine caused by population density. Don't too many people sometimes cause the warfare? Uh, well, let's have a look, for instance, at Rwanda, which is uh, claimed to have been caused by Baroness Chalker by excessive population. Not in fact, it's by Baroness Chalker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Baroness Chalker was speaking before... Oh, no, not by Baroness Chalker. <laughs> No, um, the, the fact about Rwanda is that the population of Rwanda, the, the population density is about half that of Holland. You know, I don't see the Dutch cutting each other's throats. David Cook, your witness. But in terms of population, you're a renegade Anglican, now a Catholic. You believe in spacing families. You believe in a natural means of controlling population. So the end is the same. All you disagree about is the means. Um, I think we've got to have a very clear distinction when we're talking about the moral issues underlying all this, between family planning and population control. I have no objections whatever, as a Catholic, to family planning. I think we can talk about the details of it. I mean, I could recommend the Billings method, which is more reliable than the pill method. What is known as the dangerous period? No, no, well, the, 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 the Billings, yes, the, the Billings method um, is now being accepted by the World Health Organization and by the uh, British Medical Journal um, as being as reliable as the pill and without any of the medical problems associated with it. Hold on a second, not, David Starkey. Mm. Uh, is there not, in fact, a little notion of what sin constitutes? Isn't mm. sin an in intention? Isn't the whole reason for debate on birth control that it's supposed to be sinful to copulate without wishing to have children? Now, what you're doing is you're saying that that really isn't the question at all. What we'll do instead is we will debate the number of condoms that can sit on a pin's head, which is very bad for condoms. Surely you are actually conceding that it is all right for people to have sex without wanting children, providing they use your peculiar method, which is a bit risky. I'm not actually bringing that, any argument of that sort into this particular then debate at all. Then what are you doing? Well, I mean, you're putting these words into my mouth. When have I ever said that? I'm trying sorry, to find a little logic. We're talking about the world's population. No, we're sorry. trying to find a little logic behind can your I, position. Can Please, I Janet. Janet. Well, what is my position? I didn't mention any of that. But you did advocate a particular method of contraception, which, well, said, if, you're, if, you're grand, yeah. if you're grand, actually... A, requires a degree of sophistication on the part of the users that is quite unrealistic no, to it's expect. Quite and I don't and mean it's not that unrealistic. in a I don't know wait a minute, hang on. I don't mean that in a patronizing mm. sense, but isn't it the case that mm. Italy, for example, a Catholic country like Italy, has the, one of the lowest birth rates in the developed world? That, well, that that's is because true. it ceased to be a Catholic country. Uh, hang, uses, on, hang on, uses large amounts of Well, uh, many, most, of its, most yes. of its members still do consider themselves mm. to be nominal Catholics. Now, if mm. the affluent, educated Catholic population of Italy can gain access legally to contraception and even abortion, why should the Vatican, isn't it ironic that the Vatican should be attempting to keep the poor, uneducated populations of the third world, who are not Catholic for the most part, should, should prevent them from having the same access? I am not at all sh clear in my mind that that's what the Vatican is trying to do. I mean, I, I think that what is actually going on in Cairo is probably rather obscure to most of us. Um, I think the, the Vatican does have very clear objections, moral objections, and so do I, to using um, abortion as a, as a, as a normal well, method no, of birth. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. No, I've finished. only got ten minutes. You've got the whole program. <laughs> abortion as a normal method of birth control. Um, I am not, as a Roman Catholic, nor do I take the Vatican to be saying, we have a right to determine your method of birth control. That's a matter for the individual conscience, which in Catholic theology uh, has absolute primacy over all other considerations. Edward, let's shift it slightly. People have chosen to practice birth control by one means or another. Let's not argue the how. Mm. And the better off they have got, the more readily they have done this, right? Witness Italy, no longer Catholic Italy, as you rightly say. Mm. Now, suppose 
you are totally right, which I don't concede for a second, but that all the food is created and the people of Africa and the rest of it suddenly become affluent and have all the things of affluence and begin to practice birth control, mm. buying evil black Protestant rubber johnnies. What will have been the moral purpose of what you've been about? Well, the fact that uh, people pay no attention to you doesn't make your position immoral. Uh, there are lots of people in Germany but in the 1930s who thought they were a, a diminishing minority. Sorry, you're not comparing. Hang on a second, Jennifer. No, of course I'm not. I'm making a point uh, in a quick way. That's all I'm doing. But it makes your obstruction less morally acceptable, doesn't it? I'm not if obstructing you write, anybody. But the Vatican is. Well, I don't actually it? claim that. I don't actually accept that. Listen, nobody has to listen to the Vatican. Oh, sorry. They have. No, they don't. They have. They have engaged in but the most obstructive. What do you imagine goes on in, a, in, in our Catholic mind? Sorry, we're talking really about. We're, all brainwashed. we're talking we have no... about the Cairo Population Conference for the mm. moment, aren't we? And we're talking about the very obstructive filibuster that has been engaged mm. in by the Vatican on the subject of abortion and contraception. Right. One, okay. The, the Cairo Conference. Quick wrap up. Uh, well, the quick wrap up. Gosh, we've only just started. I personally think that uh, anything that can be done to uh, put a spanner in the Cairo Conference uh, should be done. I think it's, uh, it, the whole thing is actually unnecessary. It's generated by a wholly unnecessary panic um, uh, based on a proposition which cannot be supported by the evidence. Um, and I think that basically the only good it can do um, is to arrive at some sort of vague resolution which everybody will ignore as they will in any case. Dr. Audie, thank you very much indeed. Our next witness is Diana Brown, who's chairman of uh, Population Concern. Uh, you heard uh, Dr. Audie, yes, Diana. Ac according to him, uh, the crisis itself doesn't exist. All presumably a liberal conspiracy, with you presumably personally part of it. How do you react to that? Well, it's, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the whole problem, because I think it, most people agree that it does exist. Just one figure alone that it has been estimated that man now has appropriated about 40% of photosynthetic um, product. That leaves 60% for all the other species. Now, if we're going to double our population, are we going to double that? Can we double it? There are actual biological limits for any population, whatever it's a population of animals, um, plants, Human beings. And we've reached it, or we're about to reach it? I don't think anybody knows, to be perfectly honest. There are a lot of worrying signs, like um, shortages of water, soil erosion, and so on. But I don't think anybody really knows this. It is very worrying whether we can go on um, as we are. And there basically, are your case is we don't want to get to the point where we no. find out. I mean, isn't it, population is not the only problem. There are problems of consumption in, in the developed world, which are just as, as serious. Uh, I'm sure we'll, 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 we'll definitely touch on that as we go on in the programme. David Stocky. You obviously heard William Oddie mock the seriousness of the situation. You heard, too, Janet Daly through a charge of hypocrisy against him for the simple reason that most Catholics in the developed world certainly use contraception, and quite a lot of them coming over on boats from Ireland to Britain uh, use abortion as well. Yes. What about another thing? How serious do you think the whole Catholic ambiguity is? How far would you accept that charge of hypocrisy in the Catholic position? Oh, I'm sure they're not hypocritical. I'm sure the Pope very, very strongly believes in his position. Yeah. But I, I, in today's Independent, there was a very good line that the Pope is probably the only world leader who doesn't have to worry about Catholic opinion because the majority of Catholics are not with him. But, right, well then granted that, doesn't it get even worse that what we have here is the Pope assuming this role? Why is he assuming it? If he's not even speaking for Catholics, what is he and his, rep or rather, what are his representatives doing at Cairo at all? Well, the Vatican has an anomalous position. It's the only religion that's represented as a state at the UN. This has caused quite a lot of resentment, I think, among people who follow other religions. C can I just pick up this point about um, the responsibility, if you like, of the developed world of the West, of however you choose to describe it? Uh, do you feel that, that we in, the, in countries like, like this one bear a responsibility for this sort of situation? I think that we're all part of one global community now. I think well, our nice world has say, changed, and I think that means that we cannot, cannot hold ourselves aloof from what's going on in developing countries. So what do you we, we, we have a responsibility to help with all kinds of development, not just to do, for example, with family planning, although family planning has been the Cinderella of development. 
Janet, Janet is it? That could be seen as a dangerously patronising sort of view, isn't it? A well, we're journalists. I yes. mean, they're not. Yes, yes. Oh, I don't quite. think we have obligations. Yes, obligations perhaps, but a responsibility to tell other people how no. to conduct the most private aspect no, of their no, lives. No, I, I, I mean, I, would you just I would, can I put something with that? Can I put something mm. to you that we uh, there is a natural check, seems to be a natural check on population growth in developed countries. As people become richer, they tend to have smaller families. Mm. But that's because as they become richer, they become more sophisticated they have access to the means for limiting their families. Isn't what we really need to do to make those means available and to avoid the kind of obstructions that, say, the Vatican is putting up to having those means be available? If people have the choices and they have a reasonable amount of economic security, they will limit their families naturally. Uh, well, I agree. I mean, but part of the choice is certainly access to decent quality family planning. And... Uh, there has been an awful lot of hot air talked about this. There have been a lot of mistakes made in the past with development programmes and with family planning programmes in particular. But there are a lot of statistics from recent research that show that, in fact, if we actually listen to what people need, if we give them what we need, we'll go past the demographic target set by governments. You don't have to do here. that. Here are we we're in the West where there's too little population. The two-thirds world has too great a population. So we say it's our problem and we force on the two-thirds world, our particular view, in the same way in terms of environmental issues, we say to people, don't use up the rainforest because it's going to spoil our world, though the rainforest is necessary for fuel and for providing natural resources for people. It's Western imperialism. Well, it isn't Western imperialism what we're doing. Population concern deals with uh, women's groups in many developing countries. We listen to, they come to us. We cannot actually fund all the projects we're asked to fund because there is a tremendous demand and it's very often driven by women who and uh, one of the things I hope this is going to come out of Cairo is that there will be an understanding of how important the role of, of women own. is. You have an agenda of your own you're inflicting on people. What agenda is that then? Well presumably it's a particular view about population, it's a particular view about control of population, it's a particular view of controlling the world environmental crisis which was where you started. We started off by recognising, our organisation Population Concerns started off by recognising that there was a problem. But we have been associated for more than 20 years with programmes in developing countries. And believe me, what we do is listen to people and find out what they want. Diana Brown, thank you very much indeed. Thank our you. next witness is Joanna Bogle, a columnist on the Catholic Times. Joanna, you've heard what we've been saying. The Pope's come in for a bit of bit of stick really. What, what is this Pope about? Uh, how, how has the church got itself into a position where it appears to be, to many people, to be sabotaging this big UN conference? I think the church has got itself where it's got itself for the last 2,000 years, speaking with the calm, quiet, authoritative voice of what is morally right and, and true and beautiful. Also, as far and away the biggest welfare pro provider, um, runs more hospitals and so on than anything else on the globe, it can speak with the authority of working for the poor and particularly in non-Christian countries where their philosophy doesn't even include a value of the individual. You know, if you're poor it's because you did something wrong in a previous karma. We say everybody matters. Every single person matters. It's worth fishing babies out of a gutter. They matter just as much as posh people who sit on television programmes. <laughs> Janet, your witness. Can we talk about what it was the Vatican actually was obstructing for the most part at Cairo, which was a resolution that the Cairo conference wanted to pass that said, where abortion is legal, it ought to be safe. That was it. Now, do you really feel that the Vatican cr did a credit to itself by obstructing a resolution of that kind? Oh, yes, it made me very proud to be a Catholic. First, because the Vatican, you know, has had 2,000 years of experience on this, and we know uh, in, the, in the Catholic Church, when people twist words, abortion is never, of course, safe for the baby. She is always killed, and it, it mostly, alas, is she. It's the little girls that are being aborted in China and India in vastly more proportion than the boys. Uh, so it's not safe for the child. Second, we will not concede that if something is wrong, it ought to be done in the safest possible circumstances. I mean, that's like saying, you know, where torture is legal, it must be done but in clean, hygienic prisons. I mean, forgive that's me. just silly. Forgive me. Or burning you people have... alive, which Sorry. the church was remarkably good yeah. at. Can, can can you, hang on a you, second, David. Your Janet. view on abortion, you must admit, is a minority view, even within Catholic countries. Now, you are confident enough, and if I may say so, arrogant enough, to want to impose that view on the great mass of the world's population, who for the most part are non-Catholic, 
How do you justify that? I think the church will often be in a minority. I mean, you know, in the Colosseum we were in a tiny minority in Nero's day. And the only moral quality we've got is that we, we speak by what we know to be true and we try to live this out. But what is interesting is that, of course, there is a sense in which there has been a, an almost accidental sort of strategic alliance with Islam. And I always think it's funny because people say, why don't all the great religions agree instead of having wars? And they, that's true, they should. And then when we do, everybody sneers yeah. at us. Yeah. 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 David, 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 hang on a second. Okay. Edward, Edward. Can we just relate this to the lives people lead? Yes, it's very important. If you important take children that we do. in Rio de Janeiro, for example, playing around the fountains, the street children who stand a pretty fair chance of being knocked off by a good Catholic policeman with a rosary in his pocket for being street children, the murder that there has been. What is the point of anything coming down a uterus for good theological reasons? Did we posit it in an em environment like that? First, the good Catholic policeman is most unlikely to be doing it, and it's the church more than oh. anyone else which has spoken out against it. But much more importantly, what about the people in the overcrowded countries? Rio de Janeiro isn't. The most easily the most densely populated country in the world is Holland. They have Rio a famine for half the year. They call it winter. Rio if you want to talk about killing off children because there are too many of them, why not start in some of the countries that are really crowded, not the poor countries, which in the many ways are simply empty? Killing of children happens now in Brazil but what I don't by, the, by, by persons pretty close to authority. And describing abortion, 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 abortion as the killing of children is extremely tendentious. Well, of course you think it is, and that's fine. Why not? But I think it's a little tendentious to talk about rosaries in but pockets. I mean, absolutely. let's just talk very calmly about the poor We're and different. about the people who help the poor. And you've got right. to admit that we're when it comes to doing that, the Catholic Church is second no, to no one. You're talking about a Catholic a society, right? No, we're Portugal. not. I only wish we Portugal. were Portugal. in Rio de Janeiro. I'm, 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 you're talking about anything but a Catholic society. The biggest growing a church there is the evangelical so what, Protestant so what, what, one, because what, the Catholic Church hasn't been doing so, nearly so enough. One more, Edward. What, what, what is it you have done wrong in these Catholic countries, like Brazil, Italy, Spain, that they have left you in order to have contraception? We failed to evangelize. It's really interesting, especially since the um, 1960s. The church has been stifled. We follow the secular road. And throughout my lifetime, the overriding feeling of, of being a Catholic is that you should apologize for it. And when this present pope has been, you know, more papal and so on, everyone says he's frightfully right-wing and how dreadful. Even when I was at a Catholic school, there was a feeling of almost of apology. I, I was a teenager in the 60s. I do hate to interrupt this beatitude, <laughs> but you were boasting about your alliance with Islam at the I conference. I wasn't. I pointed out it had happened. Right. Well, then, shall we investigate what principles are being deployed? Because, after all, in Iran, you're dealing with the outstanding persecutor of Christendom. I couldn't agree Christianity. more. Then why are you alive? Well, I said it was an interest. What hmm. wonderful principle. Isn't it the typical casuist I said, which has uh, no. underpinned Catholicism David, throughout you, its yeah, history? Right. No, I said it was an accidental alliance. And, and one of the things that's extraordinary I mean, is just the Please let her finish. I, I said it was accidental, it remains so. And one of the things that's extraordinary is that the church, which has suffered so much at the hands of Islam, will nevertheless allow them to speak and will recognize that they do at least appeal to the idea that human beings matter and that they are made in the image of somebody who oh, is you're entering into David. an unholy you're entering into David. an unholy alliance against been, enlightenment it's aren't no, you well that's just yes. simply oh, a it's, a it's the most Penal, it is, it's accidental it's happened and i think it's rather Pious fine that with all these perhaps? dreadful wars we've is had new pope? you know at last we had it can we but, stop haranguing yes. Jan? can i just ask you a very simple question about this particular population problem yes now do. That we get off this do you accept that there is going to be a population no, problem? No, of you course don't? not. You don't think you know, that anything should be done at all? You know, when our Anglo-Saxon ancestors lived on this island, uh, let's say in, in the time of the Seven Kingdoms, when the population, which wasn't of course counted, but was very much less than a million, they lived in unbelievable squalor with minimal medical services, frightfully short lifespan. Here no. we are, 57 million of us. We've even stopped digging out the coal that we know is beneath us in huge quantities. Life is immeasurably richer. So and we can care for our you poor. David, so David you Cook, I'm glad David Starkey. I approve of people, and it's just really nice there are 57 the million of us. David Cook, you're delighted at the moment. Good the people grief. like you have moral principles. The difficulty is inflicting your morality on other people. And that's what makes me uneasy about what's been happening in Cairo. It feels like an infliction of your morality on other folks. A I wonder who's doing answer, the inflicting. Yeah. The people pushing the pills to the women of the third world who won't get any follow-up. The people in India who gave men sterilizations by telling them fibs. That's one side, but the you're people also in China inflicting. who forced all these little boys to be born who will never find brides and have homes and families of their own. Who's doing the inflicting? The eternal voice of right and wrong says, you know our stand? We've always said it. For what it's worth, it's there still. Listen to the voice of calm, 
quiet morality. And don't let anybody put you on the pill if you don't want to be put on the pill. It's your choice with your conscience before Almighty God. Joanne, you thank to... you very much indeed, John. Thanks very much indeed for coming along. Our next witness is Amrit Wilson, who's a writer and lecturer in women's studies, feminist and anti-racist. Well, you get the picture. Um, you, you see different reasons behind all this concern, don't you, Amrit? Yes, I don't think there is a crisis in population. I think the crisis is in the capitalist system. I think it's because there's massive unemployment in most advanced developed countries, uh, because um, there's a fear that the resources of the world will no longer be mainly available to the few um, develop, highly developed countries, as they call themselves. So you say um, this is a, a, a... Yes, I think that there's a Capitalism fear. is the villain? No, I don't think it's a villain. I think it is a villain, but that's not the issue. The point is that there's a crisis within the system, and they're afraid that, that it, will, it will be destroyed, and they want to keep their share of the cake. David Stanfield. But isn't there a real problem here? Isn't it only in capitalist countries that we can feed people, that we can give them proper medical attention? Doesn't the third world actually depend on the little spillings from our table to survive at all? No, I think it's the, the advanced capitalist countries which depend on the third world, on the plunder of the third world, which is still going on. So because you, you wouldn't be rich if those people out there were not poor. Now, let's investigate this a little bit more carefully. Uh, the area, as we've heard before, that is by far the poorest in the world is Africa. Now, isn't it perfectly clear that the West has very little strategic interest in most of Africa? Otherwise, we'd be treating Africa exactly as we did the Middle East, exactly as we did Kuwait, and we'd be going in there. We abandon it precisely because it is not of economic significance. On the contrary, I don't know if you've read um, a recent um, paper which has been published by the Pew Foundation in America, which is a collation of the documents of the CIA, the US State Department, and so on. And they mention Africa specifically, and they say that Africa is most important for the survival of the system it's a very because old they have when was the date of this? It's a very old document. That's no, it is not. It appeared in 1993. Uh, no, it's an and addition of a document which appeared much earlier. And no. you're forgetting the whole process of substitution. The oil crisis demonstrated perfectly clearly that small quantities of, of rare raw materials are very easily synthesized. This is an account which simply yeah. does not Hold water. Jan, no, hang on a second, David, your witness. But even if in the end you think it's Western capitalism which is the problem, your solution is feminism. No, isn't... I did not say that. Well, is it or isn't it? No, my solution is not feminism well, it's because you women? don't know what you understand by feminism may be completely different from what I understand. Well, what is the solution then? I think the West should get out of our countries and allow the people so to no live for themselves. No no to not. Aid Trade. always brings contracts, Trade. right? So aid is quite mm -hmm. often what's responsible for poverty. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. You, right? so, so just and leave but people to their own resources. Is, no, the first thing is they must sort out the mess which they have created. In every country which is a colony, as soon as the colonizer left, there was a but war. But sorry, how do they sort out the mess without intervening? If they're to leave, mm -hmm. how do they sort out the mess? Well, they should repay what they've taken. They should assess it and repay well, it. Well, that's presumably and that how aid could be. Done. That's, that's presumably how no, aid could aid be understood. No, but aid always has strings. No, it's not understood that way because well, aid is always right, got strings attached. All right, right. Let's, let's not go down. This is a bit of a red herring from the point of view of our discussion. But hasn't your your view about a capitalist conspiracy? I find very strange. I mean, hasn't a great deal of the starvation and the suffering in Africa, in fact, been linked directly to corrupt Marxist governments? Well, I don't think I'm saying it's a capitalist conspiracy. I'm saying that capitalism were, doesn't... Sorry. No, I never use the word conspiracy. Oh, right. I think co yes. capitalism doesn't have a choice. Right? Capitalism is having a hard well, time. Does Marxism and have a choice, I, then? I, I what just, about, can what I about, just finish the point yeah, I'm making? Yeah. I think what the West is afraid of is that these so-called third world countries will turn around and demand their share of the cake. And right. the paper which I mentioned was a part of American policy in the 70s. But there's another paper which has come out which re repeats this. Okay. And this well, but let's 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 hang on a second, hang on a second. Let's not get bogged down with papers no, that no, none, of, none of us have read. Edward, your witness. I was going to say, why should we mind if they do demand? They and whose army? Why should that frighten us? Sorry? You said that we are afraid that the third world will turn around and demand whatever it was. Well, why should that matter to us? If a lot of countries, which for whatever reason are economic brothels, total failures, zilches, get around and yell at us, we demand, what does that mean to us? Exactly, you're right. Why, I, should, it, why should it have any No, effect? you have misunderstood me. In fact, we're talking at cross purposes because I think it's not a question of demand. It's when they force the issue. How when will they people, force it? when. How? Okay. 
War? When? Invasion? No, when they, they get rid of the uh, tyrannical rulers whom the West has imposed on hey. so many of our countries. Oh, really? The capitalists, yes. the, it, the capitalists surely have not been imposing. It's the Marxist tyrannical rulers of well, Africa I'm we need to concern about ourselves about. Well, you see, these are all words well, like what? feminism, Marxism. What they mean rulers something have else. been imposed by capitalism they mean in Africa? What rulers are you talking about? Hold on I'm a second, talking about, Janet. Let's look at a country like India, right? No, we're talking about Africa. Okay, what, rulers about what rulers have been appointed by capitalist leadership? In yeah, look at Mobutu. Wait a moment. Let look him, at please let Amrit answer. Look at Mobutu in Zaire. Is he not, uh, has he not been set up by the West? Well, that's, uh, that's your view. What about the leaders? Of, yeah. What about Mengistu? I mean, uh, what, you know, yeah, the, surely was, the most devastating You know, effect. Mengistu's government was supported economically by America, and during the famine, they were exporting yeah. food and growing coffee. They so, were linked up to the yeah, world market, can which I, was can basically I just, can dominated I just bring by the West. Bring you back to the point about women and empowering women. You don't no, like the I'll word feminism, but presumably you do like empowering women, and you do like yeah. the idea that women oh, should have a choice about controlling their own fertility. Yes. Isn't capitalism the system that gives people the maximum amount of choice? Well, I can illustrate that by talking about the population control policies. That's not giving third world women a choice. And incidentally, we've been talking about the Pope a lot and how he's opposed population control. Well, he's not who, a the people we've I mean, completely ignored are third world women who are organizing right there in Cairo and protesting about these policies because of what these policies have done to their bodies. And what is being done in the name of choice is actually control and it's devastating. But David, you would you like to pursue that? I'm quite happy then if two-thirds world women make a choice not to have female children to abort them. Because well, that would be the logic no, of your position. They have not. What is happening in they India? Have in India no, they have in, in India they haven't cho chosen that. What's happened in India is India has imposed something called the net reproductive rate being one, which means that every woman is permitted to have only one daughter. Now what that leads to is encouragement to a society which prefers boy babies to kill girls. But it's right? women make up that society. They no, prefer. they don't have power within that society. But now they're being forced into that. But Even if, more. If they there don't is have no power, power already, where is this power going to come from? How are we going to bring about this revolution if we simply withdraw and leave it to their own devices? That's well, the last question. What you've done so far, you meaning the West, is take away power from all the people at the bottom, men and women. So maybe it'd be best if you got out anyway. Thank you very much indeed. Our last witness is Dr. David Coleman, who's a highly regarded lecturer in demography at Oxford University. Um, you go along with all these doomsday scenarios, uh, do you, Dr. Coleman? No, and, I and don't. Think you don't. Uh, I, but you I'm think we ought to be prepared for uh, an invasion of people from, uh, from if you like, the, the third world? There are certainly pressures. Can I answer your first question mm. first? Um, uh, I think there is, is a serious population problem, has been one for some decades and will be one for some decades. I don't go along, though, with catastrophic scenarios, neither in Central Malthus, for that matter. Um, what, what we do have, though, I think is, is a problem arising out of this chronic period of population growth, whereby people are naturally attracted to move from third world countries to the industrial world, um, partly because of population pressures in their own country, also, of course, because of the enormous income disparities. So, you see the have-nots? Yes. On our doorsteps, wanting to, wanted to get in. Or certainly wanting to share. be on the doorstep. Well, many of them, of course, already are through asylum claiming and illegal immigration and all the rest of it. David Cook. Am I my brother and sister's keeper? And if I am, how far does that go in my responsibility to others? Well, that's, that sounds rather, rather like a question couched in religious language rather than language which well, I can easily deal with. It's more language of religious language. language. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, what, what are you saying? That we, that we should cope with the problems of the third world in the industrial countries? Surely not. Natural increase I in the world is of the order of 86 million people per year. But do we have a moral we, responsibility to give aid, to help people? Oh, give, giving aid is a different matter. But what I'm saying is that, that there is no possibility, either in, 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 in uh, reality or in, in terms of political practicability, of accommodating the needy of, of the third world in the industrial countries. There are simply too many of them. There are 5.6 billion people in the world already. There are going to be 3 or 4 billion more in the next 20 years or so. Almost all of that increase will take place in the third world. So the problems have got to be solved in the third world, not in Europe. Aid, yes, of course, but aid is not a shortcut to solving the problem. So what do you imagine we will have to do, if you like, to, to protect ourselves and our way of life uh, from an uncontrolled influx of people who are hoping to share in what we've got? 
Well, I think the, the point which I would make is there are no easy options. It's often said, oh, well, we, we, must, we must mitigate population growth, we must mitigate economic uh, inequalities by means of increasing aid and, and trade and all that. Yes, excellent. Easily justifiable on, on their own merits, never sure. mind the population effects. The problem is that um, it will take a long time uh, for that sort of help to make any serious difference whatsoever, and either in, the in the population growth or, or, in, or in the economy. Uh, in, in the meantime, if it is the case uh, that um, there are arguments for keeping um, uncontrolled immigration out of the industrial world, and I think there are, but if there are, then the consequence is that the, the, the populations which vote for those, uh, for that, that policy, are going to have to take some, some, uh, some hard options Such in as? paying serious economic and, 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 and political costs uh, in, in doing rather more than they are doing at the moment because, um, uh, by which I mean uh, swallowing notions like uh, more general use of identity cards, um, uh, trying to link aid with policies to stop people allowing their own would-be illegal immigrants and asylum claimants uh, uh, leaving their own countries on, under false documents. Things of that kind, things which may seem intrusive, difficult, politically unacceptable at the moment. Dr. Kilman, we can put up our own Berlin Wall at Dover and we can do all the hard-faced things, the dogs mm. and the electricity as well, to keep out the undesirables, quote-unquote. Mm. But you wouldn't be happy merely to be doing that. You would want the other half of it, presumably. The other, the other half being what? The rest of the world, aid, trade, what we do to grow food for the world. I wouldn't dream of arguing against aid and trade. In fact, I'm strongly in favour yes, of, of but, free trade. And, but, uh, and, no, and I, I appreciate you said that. What I want to do is to press you on to real hard specifics. If you're going to ask us to say we will live with a draconian regime of exclusion, I'm going to ask you what major sacrifices you think it right and proper for us to make out of the taxpayer's pocket to become major contributors to world food production, for example? Well, I, I, I'm not actually a fiery crusader in, in this matter. Um, I don't believe there will have to be draconian measures. Um, and um, I, I don't believe either that, that, that we have to try and stop immigration. Migration backwards and forwards between countries is a perfectly natural thing to happen to any open society engaged in world trade. you don't want a lot of hungry poor people banging on the door. Well, it's not actually hungry poor people who do bang on the door. Hungry poor people just usually manage to stagger across one boundary um, from one third world country into a second one. It is not the hungry and the poor that end up on Europe's doorsteps. It is the somewhat better educated, better of people who can become asylum claims. Can okay, lowest, pro pro lowest common more. denominator, you want to keep out the, the poorest um, people in the world's slightly better off Uncle Ahmed who might make it through customs. Well, they're not, they're not particularly poor people who are making it to <laughs> Europe at the moment. What I'm saying is that, that, that um, uh, one, I think there's a very good case for um, maintaining the law of European and other industrial countries which says that the only people uh, who are in that country are those who are legally entitled to be there. Uh, and secondly, I'm saying that at the moment this, this battle is only partly being won and that rather more steps are required if you want to do it. If you don't, fine, don't bother. Can we, just, can we just get off the subject of migration for a moment, yes. which is a bit of a, a sidetrack from the main issue? There is no doubt a conflict between individual freedom in a very personal area of people's lives, which is to say their sexual relationships and their desire to have children, and what might be mass poverty and suffering. Now, where would you personally draw the line when it comes to curtailing individual private freedoms? You're talking now about general population yes. growth, I take it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's any need to, to, to um, curtail freedoms at all. Um, in fact, it's quite the opposite. I've been rather surprised to hear all this talk about, about uh, control and suppression and all the rest of it. What uh, all our experience shows is that when people are better educated, yes. when, they, when they are better off, uh, when they really have a choice, when they are not mm -hmm. oppressed by priests or husbands or whatever, right. then it naturally follows that they choose to have smaller numbers of, of babies. Providing they yes. have a degree of, of an economic yes. security. Yes. Cho choice leads to lower fertility, usually. If oh, it doesn't, well, then too bad. Dr. Coleman, what is the realistic chance of introducing a nice educated capitalism into Rwanda? <laughs> Oh, well, the capitalism hasn't got to be there. The curious thing is that, the, that there are substantial declines in the birth rate uh, in some of the very poorest countries of the world, most spectacularly Bangladesh, merely a, a, as, as a consequence of the diffusion of knowledge and op opportunity for access to birth control. Um, you haven't got to have the development, rather to everyone's surprise. Dr. Coleman, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. It, it it, it strikes me, panel, that, we're, that there are two questions here. Is, first of all, is there a problem? And second, what is morally justifiable in dealing with if there is? David, well, Cook, there, I think there a is problem, a problem, first of all? Yes, I think there is a problem, but the chances of finding a solution which are morally acceptable, given the, the moral difference between these two sides, is enormous. And what did you make of some of the people we, we, 
who spoke to us. Uh, well, Dr. I, Roddy, for instance, did you go along with his... I think uh, my difficulty is I have no problem with people having a very strong sense of morality. I'm all for that. My unease is inflicting the morality. And what I find from the Catholic wing and from the population wing is both sets inflicting their morality on other people. And that seems to me less than coping with the issue. D there isn't you go along a, with that? There, no, there isn't. With the idea of a problem? First the, no, there isn't a problem. There are several, in fact, there are two substantially distinct problems. In the West, our population is arguably beginning to fall, but we consume more and more resources per capita. In the third world, or sections of the third world, and particularly Africa, it is rising, and it is rising relentlessly. And I find Dr. Coleman's last remarks in a sense deeply disturbing because the whole sections of Africa where it seems to me that the willful attempt at introducing modernity by for example medicines which enormously reduced child mortality but do not make more resources available there's a deep so irony well Will there's you a deep to save children well perhaps that we begin consciously to re-ruralize these countries that the, in a sense maybe Amrit is right that this patchy Western intervention with all those motivations of those nice Catholic missionaries may be ultimately disastrous Edward, re-ruralise, that's a lovely that's expression, right. isn't it? Back to the Stone Look, Age, the presumably. Bit the, the bit of the argument that we were in serious danger of losing, I'm trying to get into it at this point, is that the argument is for availability. That is to say, not coercion. Mm. Chinese Access. style, Mrs. Gandhi style, we're talking uh, education mm. where we can get it and availability of the means. And all evidence seems to suggest that give, given women a chance, mm. they will grab it with both hands and they will be right to do all so. Let me just fit this into it, to, to the rest of it. What David's saying about Africa. I don't think you can re ruralize it. They tried it in Tanganyika and it didn't work. It's called Ujume and it was in Sanasta. Now, what you might say is this. Population control and availability of contraception is a holding operation in that interim in which you hope you will persuade people to a more efficient pr uh, production of food and, and better use of resources. But you don't, as the Catholics do, as, as, as William Motty was doing, treat them as if they were options and alternatives. They're not options and alternatives. Uh, Janet? Uh, the re-ruralising aspect is very significant here because it seems to me that political organisation, political leadership is absolutely crucial to this question. What was happening in a great many countries in Africa is that peasant rural populations were being deliberately, quite systematically mm -hmm. starved, rather in the way that Stalin sort of starved yeah. out his peasant populations for political reasons. What we have to do is empower individual people to be able to make their choices. They have to have a degree of economic and political security before they're prepared to limit but, their But hang on a second, David. But, David Cook, but, but, but meanwhile, before you get into this lovely situation, yes, uh, what you uh, do first. how far, yeah. you, you're an ethicist, how far is it morally <laughs> justifi justifiable, how far is it morally justifiable to actually control people's reproduction, maybe people in other countries' reproduction. I don't think we can. I think Janet is right that, that we should give people the choice. What what is right, here? What, what carrots can we, uh, if it's not sticks, what carrots is it morally right? Uh, let, da let David finish, please. Well, I think that, that in terms of carrots, if I were a Roman Catholic and believed as Roman Catholics believe, then the prospect of obeying God's will, the prospect of eternal life would be a sufficient carrot. If you don't believe in that, then there's a different sense. What worries me, though, is that the whole emphasis is their problem. The problem begins with us, with Western consumerism, and we have got to live more simply so that others can simply live. Oh, yeah, that's a wonderful thought. Yes. What, 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 what does that actually mean? Look, no, it means that we have to look at our particular patterns of consumption. Exactly and because yeah. one we use time. Africa, one we time. Use Africa David David to produce kiwi fruit for yeah. our table, we, we get them to change their basic kind of production system for our benefit. And if they were to grow their own basic kind of material, then they could live and then they could have a but reason. Sorry, that's that's proper re exactly the David, opposite. Very short yeah, exactly the opposite is the truth. The, the only chance that these countries have of growth with moral decency, with proper conditions of life, is if they're incorporated in international trade and international capitalism. And the problem is that their cultural values and their society and their economies totally militate against but that. David, that's it. That's it for this week. We'll be back next week at the earlier time of 11 for another trip into the moral maze with this unruly bunch. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>